Good morning, everybody. Today we will continue with Newton's laws of motion. So again, we will deal with motion, but we will take the forces into the account. So what we have within this chapter, we will learn what the concepts of force means in physics, and then why forces are vectors. We will use forces as vectors and then they will have vector components. And we will also talk about the significance of the net force on an object. Net force, you can say vector sum of all forces act on an object. We will deal with this one. And then we will see what happens when the net force on an object is zero. So let's consider that you have an object. We have an mass for example and there are many forces acting on that object but the net total force acting on the object is zero okay then what happens we will learn this and another important term within this chapter the significance of inertial frames of reference it is very important to discuss the forces acting on objects within this chapter, and then we will deal with how the acceleration of an object is determined by the net force on the object and the object's mass. So we will learn the relation between mass and acceleration. We will learn the relation between force and acceleration. Then, probably during the next lecture, the difference between the mass of an object and its weight will be discussed. So finally, we will learn the Newton's third law, how the forces that two objects exert on each other are related. So we have an object and then you apply force on this and then it also applies back force to you. So this is the Newton's third law of motion. Here we have Newton's first law of motion when the net force on an object is zero. This is the first law. And then if the net force acting on the object is different from the zero, this is the Newton's second law. And then this is the Newton's third law. So within this chapter, we will learn all the things, three laws of motion determined by Newton. So during the last lecture, we have learned motion along a straight line. We have learned motion in two or three dimensions. We have discussed acceleration. We have discussed the velocity and the relation between velocity and acceleration. So we have described the motion, okay? So this was kinematics. What is the meaning of kinematics? You are dealing with motion, but this description does not include any force, okay? So within this chapter, we will discuss why bodies are moving, what causes bodies to move, okay? So we will deal with this sources. It means that we are talking about dynamics. So the relationship of motion to the forces that cause it. So this is the main difference between kinematics and dynamics. Within the dynamics, we have forces. Within the kinematics, we don't deal with the forces. We just describe the motion. So the principles of dynamics stated for the first time by Sir Isaac Newton, and today we call them Newton's laws of motion. So as I told you at the beginning, we have three laws. And within this chapter, we will learn them step by step. So now let's discuss the properties of a force, first of all. A force is a push or a pull. For example, here there is a mass and this is hand of somebody and then he or she pushes this mass. So then we have a force acting on this object. Or there is a rope here and then you are pulling this object with some certain force. This is push, this is pull, okay? And 
another property of a force, a force is an interaction between two objects or between an object and its environment. We will discuss this one. A force is a vector quantity, as we have shown here with an arrow on top of it, with magnitude and direction. So you know already each vector has certain magnitude and direction. So if you are dealing with the forces, you have to use this information. And we have four common types of forces. So don't forget this one, four common types of forces. Normal force, friction force, tension force, and weight due to the gravity, okay? Four forces, weight, tension force, friction force, and normal force. Now let's describe them step by step. So what is normal force? Here we have an object, and this is the ground, let's say, and this object has certain mass, okay? Due to the gravity, this object applies a force on this surface. And then this surface applies a back force to this object. So this is called as normal force. Definition is here, when an object rests or pushes on a surface, the surface exerts a push on it that is directed perpendicular to the surface. So here we have an horizontal surface. If you have such surface, then the direction of the normal force perpendicular to the surface, okay? Don't forget this one. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. Normal force is a contact force. What is the meaning of the contact force? So there is a contact between this object and this surface. Let me show you here with a pen. We have a surface here. And then we have object. Let's say it is hanged. So there is no normal force here. There is another force I will describe within the forthcoming transparencies. So in order to have normal force, we need a contact, okay? We have a contact here, and here we have a contact. For this reason, normal force is a contact force. Now, let's continue with the friction force. Friction force is also a contact force, so you need a contact between the object and the surface of the material or surface of the ground. So in addition to the normal force, a surface may exert a friction force on an object directed parallel to the surface. So normal force perpendicular to the surface, but the friction force is parallel to the surface. The direction of the friction force can be either in this direction or in this direction, depending on its movement depending on the conditions in the problems, okay? But it must be parallel to the surface. Normal force is perpendicular to the surface. And sometimes we consider that this surface is frictionless, okay? In such cases, the friction force will be zero, okay? But sometimes the friction force is also included within the problems and questions and you must be very careful. And let me continue with the tension force. This is also a contact force. So what is the tension force? Here we have an object, and then we have a rope, and this hand or with something else, you are pulling this object, okay? This is a tension force. A pulling force exerted on an object by a rope cord, etc. This is tension force. And it is also a contact force. If there is no contact between this object and this hand, the source of the force, there is nothing here. There is no tension force. In order to have tension force, a contact is required. And the last one, weight due to the gravity here, 
we have an object, it has certain mass. The pull of gravity on an object is a long range force, a force that acts over a distance. So this is non-contact force. Contact is not required here, okay? Without any contact, we have a gravity, we have weight of the object. So let me show you here different situations. For example, we have the same object here. There is weight here, okay? We have contact between surface and object. Or again, for this condition, there is weight, okay? We have contact here. So what about normal force? Normal force is opposite to the weight. Here, normal force is like this. Normal force is always perpendicular to this surface. So if this is moving with some certain velocity along this direction, and if there is a friction on this surface, there will be a friction force in this direction. Okay, but here, let's consider that there is an object and this is the ground and you release this object from the rest, then it has free fall and it has weight, a force acting on this object due to the gravity, okay? So contact is not required for the weight because weight is a long range force. Do you have any question related to the four main forces, weight, tension, friction, and normal? Any question? Okay, now let me give you some examples of common forces. Maybe first of all, I should mention the unit of the force. The SI unit of the magnitude of force is Newton, okay? And shortly we show it as N, capital N. So here we have some typical force magnitudes weight of a large blue veil, for example, 1.9 times 10 to 6 Newton, maximum pulling force of a locomotive, for example, 8.9 times 10 to 5 Newton, or weight of a medium apple, 1 Newton, electric attraction between proton and electron in a hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom has nucleus and one electron, Within the nucleus, there is only one proton. Proton is positively charged, an electron is negatively charged, and there is an electric attraction in between. So this force between proton and electron is given with this magnitude, 8.2 times 10 to minus 8 Newton, and gravitational attraction between the proton and electron. Electron has certain mass, Proton has also certain mass, and due to their masses, there is a gravitational attraction in between, and this is given by 3.6 times 10 to minus 47 Newton. So force due to the gravity in the hydrogen atom is much lower compared to the force due to the electrostatic attraction. Now, let's continue with the drawing force vectors. At the beginning of my talk, I have told you that the force is a vector, okay? And I can represent it in terms of vector components. So here, within this figure, we have an object, we have a box, let's say, okay? And we have a spring balance, Yaili Kantar, Yaili Terazi. And we use this spring balance to measure a pool that we apply to a box. So this is 10 Newton, this is direction of the force. Since the force is a vector, it has magnitude. Its magnitude is given with this one, 10 Newton, and its direction is also given with this one. So this is the angle between, let's say, positive x direction and force vector. So you can also write this force in terms of its components, I will show you. So here we have two forces acting on this box. This is first force, which is given by F1 in this direction, 
And this is the second force acting on the box, which is given by F2. So what is the total force or net force acting on this box? It is given with the resultant vector of these two forces, okay? This is the superposition of forces. So we have one force, here we have another force, and the superposition of the force can be written as a single force equal to their vector sum here. This is the resultant force. Several forces acting at a point on an object have the same effect as the vector sum acting at the same point. As I told you in the previous transparency, you can write this force in terms of components, X and Y component. This force, let's say this is X axis and this is Y axis. This force has only component along the X axis and it has no component along the Y axis. And this one has components along the X and Y axis, right? So by using the vector addition along the X axis and along the Y axis, you can also get this resultant vector, okay? So you can apply the rules for the vectors here for the force. Okay, now let's see another example for the decomposing a force into its component vectors. Here we have an object and here we have an inclined surface. Okay, and there is a hand, there is a rope here and this hand pulls this box in this direction, okay, with some certain force. And you can choose X axis like this, Y axis like this, but as I told you in the first chapter, second chapter and third chapter, so you can choose any direction as X or Y, okay? But of course, they must be perpendicular to each other. X and Y axis must be perpendicular to each other. So instead of this one, you can choose X axis is this one or Y axis is this one. It depends on you. It depends on your choice. But whenever you decided for the coordinate axis, so you must use this axis for the first coming calculations. So here we have X axis, here we have Y axis. This was the F vector force and this is the theta between X positive X direction and force and then this is X component of the force and this is the Y component of the force and Y and X are perpendicular to each other. So you have already learned that in order to calculate the components of this force, you have to use trigonometry. Okay, now let's go into detail a little bit with the notation for the vector sum. So what we have here, this is force one, F1 here, and here we have force two, second force. And these are the components of this first force, F1, X component of F1, Y component of F1, and here we have second force, X component of F2, Y component of F2. So then here we have resultant vector along the X axis. Here we have resultant vector along the Y axis. So this is the final vector, resultant vector, okay? And you can also write this one, sum of the forces, okay? What do you see here? One vector, another vector, head to tail, and this is resultant vector. So this is the vector sum of these two vectors. So resultant vector can be written by F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus whatever, okay? If you have more forces in different directions, you can also add them here. And then this will give us the vector sum. And this is also called as net 
force acting on the system, okay? This vector sum of the forces gives us the net force acting on a system. Okay, then let me continue with the Newton's first law. Here I have very important term which is called as equilibrium denge. Okay, you will see this term in every forthcoming chapter. If the system is in equilibrium, then it means that the net force acting on the system is zero. Okay. Listen, the Newton's first law, we will discuss this one. When a body is either at rest or moving with constant velocity, we say that the body is in equilibrium. Now let me draw these two conditions. So first condition, let's consider this is a box and this is a surface. There is a weight due to the mass and gravity, okay? And there is a normal force due to the weight, this box, this object applies a force on this surface and then this surface applies a back force, which is called this normal force. Then what is net force here? If you choose, this one is positive y direction, then the net force is n minus weight. Since they are equal to each other, the net force is zero. Then the system is in equilibrium. What is the meaning of equilibrium? It was at rest here and it will stay at rest. If the system is in equilibrium, it will keep its initial condition. Okay, don't forget. This is the first condition here. When a body is at rest. Now the second condition or moving with constant velocity. So let's consider that this body here, the same box moving with constant velocity, okay? And let's consider that the friction is zero here. There is no friction and there is a weight force and there is another force, normal force. So the total force acting on this object along the y-axis is zero, okay? But what about the force acting on along the x-axis? It is also zero because the object is moving with constant velocity. If the velocity is constant, then acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, there is no force, okay? So this is equilibrium. Both conditions are equilibrium. Here, at the beginning, it was at rest. And since the net force acting on the system is zero, it is at rest, okay? Then it is in equilibrium. Here, the object is moving in this direction, let's say, with some certain constant velocity, acceleration is zero since the velocity is constant, and the net force acting on the system is zero, then the body will continue to move in this direction with this constant velocity because the net force acting on the system is zero. The system is in equilibrium. Okay, for a body to be in equilibrium, it must be acted on by no forces or by several forces such that their vector sum, that is the net force is zero. Here, as we have discussed. So this is the Newton's first law. If the system is in equilibrium, if there is no net force acting on the system, or if there are several forces act on the system, but if their vector sum is zero, then the system is in equilibrium. This is the Newton's first law. Okay, now let's discuss this Newton's first law in this example. Here we have a hockey puck, and then we have here frictionless surface, and there is a force 
acting on this hockey puck. This is a contact force. You apply F1 on this hockey puck. And due to this force, this puck is accelerated. It has certain acceleration, okay? It is not in equilibrium. But if you apply same force in terms of magnitude, but in opposite direction, then here you have F1, here you have F2, and in magnitude they are same, but they have opposite directions, then the net force acting on this hockey puck is zero, then acceleration is zero, and the puck is in equilibrium. This is the result of Newton's first law. And let's discuss again the Newton's first law in this example. Here there is a sled in Turkish kazak, and here there is a child, and here you see a leg, okay, leg of her father or leg of her mother, I don't know. So what are the forces acting on this sled here? Let me show the forces. So let's consider that there is a friction a little bit in this surface, and then here we have a friction force, okay? And this leg applies a force here. And due to the weight of this child and weight of the sled, there is weight and we have normal force this equal amount of the weight, okay? So along the y-axis, let's say, let's choose that this is y and let's choose that this is x. Along the y-axis, what is the net force? Net force is zero. Maybe I can also shove this force along the x direction in order to simplify the question or situation. So let's consider that this leg applies force in this direction. Okay, then what about the net force along the x? Net force along the x. Let's consider the force applied by the leg and the friction force are equal to each other, then you can say that the net force acting along the x is also zero. So then this system is in equilibrium. If the sled at the beginning is at rest, it will stay at rest. But if this sled has certain velocity and movement at the beginning, then after this condition, it will continue to its moment, okay? Since the net force acting on the system is zero, okay? System is in equilibrium. You don't change the something within the system. Do you have any question here? Then let me show you two examples. This is the conceptual example 4.2 from the book in the classic 1950 science fiction film, Rocket Ship XM, a spaceship is moving in the vacuum of outer space, far from any star or planet. When its engine dies, as a result, the spaceship slows down and stops. What does Newton's first law say about this sense? Spaceship is moving in the vacuum of outer space, far from any star or planet, okay? then the net force acting on the spaceship is zero. So when its engine dies, it should continue to its movement since the net force acting on the spaceship is zero, right? But in the science fiction film, the spaceship slows down and stops. This is wrong, okay? Okay, another conceptual example. You are driving a Maserati Gran Turismo S on a straight testing track at a constant speed of 250 km per hour. You pass a 1971 Volkswagen Beetle doing a constant 75 km per hour. On which car is the net force greater? On which car is the net force greater? 
So, Maserati has constant speed. Biddle has also a constant speed, okay? So speed is constant, acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, then the force is zero. So both cars are in equilibrium because their velocities are constant. Newton's first law therefore says that the net force on each car is zero, okay? So don't forget this. And let me continue with the inertial frames of reference. So suppose you are in a bus that is traveling on a straight road and speeding up, okay? So it is speeding up. What is the meaning of speeding up? There is an acceleration, okay? Let's say it is speeding up in this direction. If you could stand in the aisle on roller skates, you would start moving backward relative to the bus as the bus gains speed. So let's consider that you are standing in the aisle. If you could stand in the aisle on roller skates, you would start moving backward relative to the bus as the bus gains speed. So you move in this direction if the bus is speeding in this direction. Okay. It looks as though Newton's first law is not obeyed. There is no net force acting on you, yet your velocity changes. So let me explain this part and please try to learn this information here within this transparency. If you don't understand, please ask question and I can repeat it for you, okay? So here we have a bus and bus is speeding up in this direction. And you are standing here with roller skates and you move in opposite direction since the bus is speeding up. So what about the forces acting on this guy here or lady here? What about the forces? There is a weight, okay, due to the gravity and there is normal force. And there are no other forces acting on this person, right? So why this person moves in this direction? The person should be in equilibrium. This is due to the inertia, okay? So the bus is accelerating with respect to the Earth and is not a suitable frame of reference for Newton's first law. Earth is used as inertial frame of reference. But what about the bus? Bus is moving, okay? Moving objects are not considered as inertial frame of reference. You can say that Earth is also moving. Earth is rotating around itself and also it has movement in the orbit, right? But we neglect these movements and we consider that Earth is inertial frame of reference. But this bus is not inertial frame of reference. So a frame of reference in which Newton's first law is valid is called an inertial frame of reference. We are talking about inertial frame of reference. So if you consider that the Earth is inertial frame of reference, then what about the position of this person? Let me draw it like this. Let's consider this is the x-axis. Let's consider this is the origin and this is the position of the person. What do you see here? The position of the bus is changing relative to the Earth's frame of reference, right? But what about the position of the person? Position of the person within the bus does not change relative to the frame of reference here, Earth, okay? So when the bus is moving in this direction, person would like to keep its position at the same position in Earth's frame of reference. So bus moves like this, this is the second position of the bus, but the position of the person again here is same 
in the Earth's frame of reference. OK, so this is due to the inertia. Here I have another example. This is the same topic, but three different conditions. Let me magnify this one. So this is a train and again with roller skates, a person is staying here. OK, and it is at rest. So vehicle, this train is also at rest. The initial velocity of the train is also zero, OK, when the time is zero. So let's consider that this vehicle is accelerated and it is moving in this direction. So since there is an acceleration, velocity is not constant. Velocity is increasing. The vehicle is speeding up in this direction. And what about the position of the person? Since the net force acting on this person is zero, then this person is in equilibrium and this person tends to remain at rest. OK, so according to the Earth's frame of reference, this person stays at rest. But if someone here within the train will see that this person is moving from this position to this position within the train, but according to the Earth's frame of reference, this person is at rest. OK, this is the inertial frame of reference. Do you have any question with that part? Then I will give you another example. Here, let me continue with the second situation. Please be careful with the initial conditions, OK? Here, you have initial condition. The person is at rest and then vehicle is at rest, OK? Don't forget. Here, I have different initial conditions. You are staying here, person is staying here, and the vehicle is in motion, OK? Both the person and the vehicle are in motion. When the time is zero, there is a velocity in this direction to the right, and the vehicle is slowing down. It means that there is an acceleration in opposite direction to the velocity. The train is slowing down, OK? so. What is the meaning of slowing down? The velocity will decrease. What was the initial movement of this person? So at the beginning, this train has velocity of this, and this person has also velocity of this. When the train slows down, the velocity of this person does not change because there is no net force acting on this person. There is weight in downward direction. There is normal force upward direction. And there are no other forces because there are roller skates, OK, here, and the friction force is zero. Then the net force acting on this person is zero. Then this person is in equilibrium. So what is the meaning of equilibrium if this person has certain velocity at the beginning, he or she will continue with this initial velocity, with the same V velocity, OK? Because net force acting on this person is zero, then the person tends to continue moving with constant velocity. Is it clear? Here I have the last example. The vehicle runs a turn at constant speed. So let's consider that. Let me use pen here again. This is a perfect circular pass, and this pass has certain radius and origin, let's say, OK? And this vehicle is moving with constant speed, OK? Then there is an acceleration, OK? Acceleration towards the center of the origin. OK, this is the origin of this circle, let's say. And this vehicle is moving in this direction with some constant velocity. So due to the acceleration, 
this vehicle is moving in this circular orbit, right? And acceleration is perpendicular to the pass, perpendicular to the pass, perpendicular to the pass. I'm talking about the acceleration of this train or acceleration of this vehicle, let's say. So what about the velocity of this person here? The velocity of this person is tangent to the pass right here V. Let's consider that at the beginning it was straight line this train is coming from and then it enters into the a curve pass okay so at the beginning the velocity of this person was v the constant speed of the train okay so whenever this train has this type of movement the net force acting on this person is zero there is weight downward direction, there is normal force upward direction, and there is no force, there is no net force along the y and x directions acting on this person, okay? So this person would like to keep its initial movement, okay? So what about the direction of its movement like this? With constant speed, this person would like to move along this direction according to the Earth's frame of reference. Is it clear? Any question here? Okay, let me show you two more examples and then maybe you better understand. Here there are crash test dummies, for example, in Euro NCAP tests, they use dummies Okay, so from the frame of reference of the car, it seems as though a force is pushing the crash test dummies forward as the car comes to a sudden stop. So let me draw here again. Here, there is a wall, let's say, and this is the ground, and there is a car here, and here there are dummies, test dummies, okay? So, this car is moving with some certain velocity and this test dummy also moves with some certain velocity okay so when this car hits this wall this car is stopped but what about the dummies the forces acting on the dummies are weight and normal force along the x-axis no forces the net force along the y direction is zero and the net force along the x direction is zero for this reason this dummy would like to keep its initial motion because it is in equilibrium the car is stopped when it hits to this wall, but this would like to keep its initial motion since it is in equilibrium, okay? But you see that a force is pushing the crash test dummies forward, but it is wrong. There is really no such force. As car stops, the dummies keep moving forward as a consequence of Newton's first law, the dummies are in equilibrium. There is no net force acting on the dummies. Any question here? Any question? Is it clear for you? Then let me finish this part with this example. So what do you see here? The same example. This guy has no seat belt. So at the beginning, this guy has certain velocity, okay? He is moving with some certain velocity in this direction. And since the net force acting on the guy is zero, he would like to keep its initial motion, okay? According to the Earth's frame of reference. Any question related to the inertial frames of reference? So, in the first part, we have discussed in Newton's first law. It means that 
the net force acting on the object or the net force acting on a system is zero. But what happens if the net force is not zero? So if there is a net force acting on the system, so Newton's second law talks about this. Here we have three conditions, A, B, and C. In the first condition, we have a frictionless surface and we have a hockey puck, okay? So the net force acting on the puck is zero, delta F is zero. Then if the puck has certain initial velocity, it will continue moment with this velocity because net force acting on the puck is zero, okay? We consider that the surface is perfect frictionless surface. Is it clear? The puck has zero acceleration because the net force is zero and its velocity is constant, okay? It does not change. So now let's have a look at the second position. If a constant net force acts on the puck in the direction of its motion. So what do you see here? We have a puck. It is moving in positive x direction, let's say, with some certain velocity, and we apply a force. So we have net force in this direction. So then we will have net acceleration in this direction. So due to this acceleration, the velocity of the puck will be increased. The puck is speeding up in this direction along the force and acceleration. The last situation, if a constant net force acts on the puck opposite to the direction of its motion. So this is the initial velocity of the puck. It is moving in positive x direction, but we apply a net force along the negative x direction. So since the acceleration is along the applied net force, then we have acceleration in negative x direction, we have velocity in x direction. So since acceleration and velocity are in opposite directions, then the puck will slow down, right? But you see here, velocity is decreasing, okay? Because there is a net force acting on the puck opposite to the direction of its initial motion. Do you have any question here? But if there is no force, if there is no net force acting on the system, then velocity is constant, okay? The system is in equilibrium. It continues to its initial movement. If it is at rest, it stays at rest. If it is moving with some velocity, it continues to its movement with that velocity. So then this gives us this relation, Newton's second law. If there is a net force on a body here, then the body accelerates in same direction as the net force. So remember this information, the direction of the acceleration and the direction of the net force are always the same, okay? Don't forget this one. This is the mass of body. So here I will show you different examples. We have, for example, an object undergoing uniform circular motion. There is a rope here. And then let's say again, this is a hockey puck and it is rotating along a circular path with constant speed. So the speed is tangential to the path at every point. And due to the circular motion, there is an acceleration, which is normal to the path, okay? So the direction of the net force will be along the acceleration. So here, acceleration from the puck to the center, then net force from the puck to the center. Here, the acceleration from the puck to the center, net force from the puck to the center. So net force is always along the direction of the acceleration, okay? 
I'm talking about the net force, don't forget. So now let's discuss the relation between force and acceleration. Here we have acceleration. If you take acceleration from this formula, acceleration will be given by net force over mass. So here we have certain mass and here we have F1. Net force is along the positive x direction, let's say. Then this force causes an acceleration along the net force. If you double the force, for example, here we have F1 in the first case, and here we have 2F1 in the second case. So we doubled the net force. So if you put here 2F1, then you will also double the acceleration. Now we have 2A, okay? because acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. If we have the force, then we have the acceleration. Here we have net force acting on this mass is given by half F1, and then we have acceleration half of the initial case, okay? Because acceleration is given by force over mass. So if you put here half force, then you will have half acceleration here. Any question related to the force and acceleration relation? Then let me continue with mass and acceleration. What do you see here? Acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass, right? So here in the first case, we have net force and then we have mass of M1, and then this net force causes A1, acceleration one, okay? And here again, we have the same net force, but we have different mass, okay? So due to this different mass, we will have different acceleration. So you apply, let me show you this example. What is the meaning of this one? So here, there is a box, for example, this M, and you apply this force. And here you have another box, this smaller M, M2, and you apply the same force. The magnitude and direction of the force is same in both cases. So this has a one acceleration, this has a2 acceleration and what do you see here if the mass is smaller then a will be bigger if you have constant force okay then if you have here two masses together m1 plus m2 then you will have different acceleration because the total mass of the system is changed, which is given by M1 plus M2. If you have a constant same force, then you will have completely different acceleration. So this is the Newton's second law of motion. The acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on it and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. The SI unit of force is given with Newton, as I told you in the previous transparencies, and one Newton is given by one kilogram, this is the unit of mass, and one meter per square second, this is the unit for the acceleration, okay, this is one Newton, and in the book, we will use the SI system, in the British system, force is measured in pounds, distance in feet, and mass in slugs, okay? In CGS system, mass is in grams, distance in centimeters, and the force in deans. So here you see system of units, force, mass, acceleration, and in SI unit system, force, Newton, mass, kilogram, acceleration, meter per square second in CGS, you have different units in British, you have different units. Instead of centimeter or meter,
feet per square second. Let me show you two examples of the Newton's second law of motion. Here you see a motorcycle. The design of high performance motorcycles depends fundamentally on Newton's second law. So you would like to produce high acceleration, okay? So you need high acceleration here. You would like to reach high velocities in a shorter time. Then the mass of the motorcycle must be smaller and then force, which is coming from the engine, must be bigger. If you have bigger force and smaller mass, then you can have huge accelerations. So here, again, application, Newton's second law. This car stopped because of Newton's second law. The tree here exerted an external force on the car giving the car an acceleration that changed its velocity to zero, like this one. This example, here we have hockey puck. This hockey puck is moving in this direction at the beginning with certain velocity, but when you apply an opposite force to its initial moment, then there will be an acceleration opposite to the initial velocity, then the velocity of the puck will be decreased, okay? Then the hockey puck is slowing down and finally it will be stopped. So like in this example, here what we have, here we have a tree and here we have a car, okay? At the beginning, this car had certain velocity along the tree, okay? And then when it hits, to tree, the tree applies a force in opposite direction to its moment, and then there is an acceleration opposite to its initial moment, then this car is stopped due to the net force acting on this car. So here I will show you four important aspects of Newton's second law, and then I will finish with two examples. So the first one is this equation is a vector equation, okay? Don't forget because force is a vector. So we can use it in component form. For example, here we can write the net force acting along the x-axis and then we can use the acceleration along the x-axis. We can use the net force acting along the y-axis and we can use the acceleration along the y-axis. And also same for the z-axis. Sometimes within the questions, for example, a y is given, and then by using these relations, you can calculate a fix, okay? So the component form of the force vector is very important in calculations, in questions. The second important aspect of Newton's second law is that we are only dealing with the external forces, okay? It is impossible for a body to affect its own motion by exerting a force on itself. If it were possible, you could lift yourself to the sailing by pulling up your belt. This is very important aspect of the Newton's second law. And the third one is these two equations, this one, net force is equal to m times a, and net force along the x-axis, net force along the y-axis, net force along the z-axis are given with m times acceleration along these axis. So these two equations are valid only if the mass is constant. So here we have considered that mass is constant. Here we have considered mass is constant, mass is constant. But sometimes mass is not constant. For example, just consider rockets, okay? They have fuel, right? But they lose their fuel, then their mass changes by time. Mass is not constant. For example, just consider railroad car or train being loaded with coal, okay? So you spend coal or you spend fuel 
for the train and then total mass of the system is decreasing or just consider a tank truck. If there is a leaking in the tank truck, then the mass of the truck will change as a function of time. So then mass is not constant. So in chapter eight, for such situations, we will deal with the concept of momentum. So finally, Newton's second law is valid in inertial frames of reference only. I will not go into detail with this one because we have discussed enough. But here I would like to show you one caution from the book. MA. So what we have done here, net force acting on the system is given by mass times acceleration. OK, this is acceleration. This is net force. But what about this MA is not a force. OK. Acceleration here, this acceleration is a result of a non-zero net force. It is not a force itself, OK? We will see also some examples related to this caution. So now let me finish my lecture with two examples. OK, this is the example 4.4 from the book, determining acceleration from force. A worker here applies a constant horizontal force, force along the positive x direction, let's say, this magnitude 20 Newton to a box with mass 40 kilogram resting on a level floor with negligible friction. So there is no friction here or negligible. So what are the forces acting on this box? There is a weight due to the mass of this box and there is a normal force Due to this surface and then there is a force applied by the worker. What about the net force along the y-axis? Net force along the y-axis is zero because this normal force is along the positive y-direction and this weight is along the negative y-direction. In magnitude they are equal to each other so net force is zero then we have only net force along the positive x direction since the friction is zero if there would be a friction this will be opposite to the force applied by the worker then the net force would be different but here we consider that this surface is frictionless so what is the question what is the acceleration of the box acceleration is Ask. So in order to find the acceleration, I have to find the net force acting on the system. Net force is given by sum of the forces along the x-axis and it is given here 20 Newton, just put it there, is equal to m times acceleration of the box along the x-axis and then here we have mass just put 40 kilogram, which is also given within the question then acceleration is 0.5 meter per square second. Do you have any question here? Another easy question. A weight race shows a ketchup bottle with a mass of 0.45 kilogram to her right along a smooth level lunge counter. So this is the uh, lunge counter. The bottle lifts her hand moving at 2.8 meter per second, then slows down as it slides because of a constant horizontal friction force exerted on it by the counter tap. So here we have a friction and due to this friction, there will be a friction force. So what are the forces? So we have weight in this direction, we have normal force in this direction, net force along the y is zero, and we have force in this direction. But what about the force along the opposite to the friction force? There is no such force here. There is no additional force here, don't forget. It started to its motion with some certain velocity, okay? and there is no force acting on the bottle during this movement along the positive x direction. 
So we have only force along the x-axis is given with the friction force. So due to this opposite force to its moment, we have we have net force along the negative x direction. Let me draw the net force along the y direction is zero and the net force along the x direction is given with this one, negative f. So if it is negative y axis, okay? So if you have net force along this direction, then you will have acceleration along this direction. So initial velocity here along the positive x direction, okay? And acceleration is opposite, then the particle will slow down since velocity and acceleration are opposite. So what was the question? What are the magnitude and direction of the friction force acting on the bottle? So in order to calculate the friction force, I should know the net force acting on the bottle, okay? And in order to calculate the net force acting on the bottle, I have to find the acceleration. So how to calculate acceleration? Remember the equation from the chapter two. If the acceleration is constant, here, look at the question. We have a constant horizontal friction force. If the force, net force is constant, then acceleration is also constant. If the net force is constant, then acceleration is also constant. If acceleration is constant, then I can use this relation for the constant acceleration from chapter two. Vx square is equal to V0x square plus 2ax and displacement, final position minus initial position. Okay, so what about the displacement? It is given, it slides for one meter before coming to rest. So displacement is given, final position, initial position, and displacement is one meter. So instead of this one, just use one meter here, okay? And then what was the final velocity? Final velocity is zero because bottle stops here at this position. What was the initial velocity? This one given in the question, then you can find the acceleration minus 3.9 meter per square second. Why it is minus? Because I have chosen this one is positive x direction. We have initial velocity along this direction and acceleration is along the negative x direction. For this reason, the sign is negative. And if you put this acceleration here within this equation, let me clean this part. So if you put this number here, if you use mass, which is also given in the question, this one, then finally you can calculate the net force acting on the system, which is given by minus 1.8 kilogram per meter square second or minus 1.8 Newton. So what is the meaning of this minus sign? Net force is along the friction force along the negative x direction. For this reason, the sign is negative. During the next lecture, I will continue with mass and weight and I will finish with the Newton's third law, action reaction pairs in the forces